Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the day. We are going to start with some lightning talks. Um, if you haven't been to PyCon before, lightning talks are very short talks, strictly under five minutes. Slides are optional, um, and they're a nice and easy way to give a talk um, if you don't want to give a full talk. And today we have uh, probably five speakers, maybe six if the one that's missing shows up. Um, and the way this is going to work is I'm going to run a timer over here on my phone. Um, and when you get down to one minute left, I will tell you one minute left. And when you run out of time, I will say last slide, at which point you should cover your last slide. And if you keep talking, I will cut you off. Please don't make me cut you off. Um, and our first speaker today is um, Johan, who should already be a presenter. Um, and he is going to be talking about building a label printer using Python, Arduino, duct tape, and paper clips. Take it away, Johan. Yes. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. I'm Johan. You've seen my face. I can hide it now. And there we go. Right. So um, I'm a developer at uh, Take a Lot, mainly Python. And uh, in my spare time, I'm a maker. Uh, as a maker, I collect a lot of stuff, usually in two liter ice cream containers, and I need to be able to label them. So middle of 2018, there was a hackathon at a makerspace nearby. Uh, I had only half a weekend uh, because I needed to be at a Bry on sa Saturday afternoon. Uh, but I wanted to build something useful in that time. So a couple of principles. First, uh, build something that works. Once it works, go on to the next thing. Second thing was the TLAR design methodology. That stands for that looks about right. Here's the physical build. Um, the idea is that I have a roll of masking tape on a threaded rod um, that is spun around slowly. As it spins, that threaded rod will advance with about one millimeter every rotation. Um, and then I have a pen that just um, can either um, ride on that masking tape um, to make a line or I lift it to stop. Software. Um, I've got a laptop uh, running a Python script. Uh, I say I want to have this text on the label, it converts it to an image, converts that to a list of lists of color values, um, which I'll show you just now, and then sends commands to the Arduino to command the pen to go up and down. Um, the Arduino is a dumb controller. It just drives the motor, sends a start position trigger to the laptop so that the laptop knows what the timing is and receives the up and down um, movements. Right, uh, the Python. This is the first bit. Uh, you can probably ignore anything in the top half of that screen. Uh, in the bottom, uh, the bottom four lines, those are the interesting ones. Uh, I'm converting the image uh, to mode one, which is just pure black and white. That's after I've got the text on an image. Then I get a list uh, of that image data. I get the height and the width of the image. And then I split that list in a, into a list of lists. So each list within that encompassing list is a is a single line of data. Uh, then I pull in uh, Pi serial. Uh, I can with which I can talk to the um, Arduino on the serial port, and basically I wait for a trigger to say this is the timing signal, and then I run um, through those pixels in the line. Each takes about sixty milliseconds, and I'll change. Um, the values, uh, I can command the pen to go up or down as, as I advance. So results. This thing took about 11 hours in total from zero to hello world. Um, 3.30 on Saturday afternoon, I was done. 
Uh, I've got 48 lines of Python code, which is kind of surprising since the Python bits do a lot more than the Arduino code. I've got no test coverage at all. Uh, I've managed to print 40 One labels. One minute remaining. Um, to date. Um, it takes about eight minutes to print a label. And I got one lightning talk out of it. Here we go. Hopefully, this video will give you an idea of what this thing looks like in practice. I don't know if the frame rate is great. But there you can see the pen going up and down um, with the uh, masking tape rolling. Um, if any one of you want to talk to me uh, about this or some of my other projects that I've listed at the right there, you're very welcome. Um, if you want to see what I'm about, uh, the all at the top should give you all the information that you need. I think that is about it from me. And that was perfect timing. And now we are going to move to Heather. who is going to talk to us about preparing for the Great Snakes migration. Okay. Um, I'm and go. I seem to share my screen, so I'll have to go without my slides. Oh, there we go. Now suddenly it's allowing me. Technology. Okay, the Great Snakes migration. You should by now have upgraded from Python 2 to Python 3 because Python 2 has been sunsetted. But sometimes things get in the way, real life happens, your business needs dictate that you actually cannot do it just yet. And so you have to put it off for a while. And hopefully this quick little talk will give you a few tips on how you can actually do that. For the company I work for, which is Siavula Education, we have pretty large code base that's been built up over a very long time. There's around 3,000 Python files that make the questions on our website because it's an educational website. And we had one big monolith that had been broken up into all these little supposed microservices that weren't actually microservices. Our first solution was how are we going to deal with these 3,000 odd Python files because they're a pretty core cool part of our service and if we try and upgrade them, things could break horribly and nobody's got time to visit 3,000 web pages. So we made the monolith, a true monolith. We identified the real microservices and then we used Docker to put all those microservices into a nice, neat little package where we could be sure that if it worked in one situation, it would work in another situation. This has created a nice, neat little walled garden around these Python files so that we can safely upgrade little bits and pieces of our system to Python 3 without having to worry about the entire upgrade at once and without having to test several thousand web pages simultaneously. Another solution, automate it. There's Python 2 to 3, and this largely works. There's obviously some issues with the auto generator because Python generally lets you do what you want, how you want it, when you want it. You can't always use an automated tool. But for the most part, run Python 2 to 3 on your files. You'll get most of the way there, and then you can just do a little bit of manual cleanup to find where you're not actually managing to get to things. And then the final piece that we also attacked was our requirements files. With most Python projects, you'll have some sort of pip install. You'll want to get a whole lot of requirements, usually from the Python cheese shop, otherwise known as PyPy. And you need We'll build these up over the course of time in a project, adding and removing, and well, usually not always removing. You'll sometimes have ones floating around. 
and after a while, you don't actually know which ones are in the most up-to-date state, which ones you actually don't need, or any of that stuff. So you have to make a consolidated list, figure out which ones can be removed, which ones can be updated, and which ones you're going to have to wait that little bit till you've got onto Python 3 before you can start using the latest version. During this process, you'll also find a few requirements, e.g. mock, that has actually been put into the core Python library, and so you will no longer need to pip install. So it's starting to identify what's all going on. So once you have all the knowledge of how your code base works, is it a monolith, is it microservices, you identify where those microservices are, you figure out what requirements you're running, and you start understanding exactly One minute what training. you do. So then you just take the plunge and do it. At some point, you have to reach the point, no matter what type of project it is, where you stop working, you take dev down for a week or so, and you just do the migration. Because if you don't do the migration, you might run into some serious problems that could close your business down. And that is a good way to motivate to higher level people. So in short, the Great Snakes migration can be a lot of fun. Just do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are now going to move to Kevin, who's going to be talking about posits, a proposed new floating point number format for machine learning. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Good. Right. So these were invented by Gustafsson and his partner. Um, very quickly, this is what a floating point number looks like. Um, I'm going to be talking about the 16-bit varieties because they are a lot simpler to draw on screen. You got a sign, which is plus or minus. Zero is positive, minus is negative. I mean, one is negative. You have a short exponent, which is just an integer interpreted from minus 14 to 15. And then you have a fraction. Remember, these are all binary. So that's a binary fraction. There's an implied one on it. So the whole number's value is just plus or minus two to the power of the exponent multiplied by one plus the fraction. And this is what a posit does instead. So that's a standard which we all use today, though usually in double precision, which is float 64. What a posit does is it keeps the sign bit, but it does something very tricky with the exponent. It expands the exponent into two parts the regime bits, and then the actual exponent bit. Now in posit 16, the exponent is just a single bit. So it's zero or one. The regime bit allows you to scale that exponent. And it's scaled by counting the number of identical bits. So there's a, either a string of all ones followed by zero, which is the R star uh, I've indicated there, or there's a, a string of zeros followed by one or a string of ones followed by zero. If it's all ones, then the value for k is m minus one, where m is the number of one bits you have, or it's minus m. Again, m is the number of zero bits. And that just gives you a four to the k factor. Now, what's actually happening here that's interesting is that that means that the regime can be a variable number. And it also means that since the regime bits can be up to 15, that can actually squeeze off the fraction, so it actually disappears. So you've got increased range with flexibility, but you also lose some of your precision because you're losing your fraction. There's a posit 32, which just doubles the number of uh, exponent bits. And now the scaling for the regime bits is done with the power of 16s. All right. So there isn't any hardware except for some uh, FPGA stuff that actually implements it. But fortunately, there's software simulation. There is a Python interface to what's known as the soft float soft posit library, which is written in C. Very simply, pip install it, and you can get going. And you can do some experiments, like what I'm going to demonstrate here. I'm just starting with a simple number, 1.23456789. X is the double precision, that's the regular Python floating point representation for that number. Then I construct a float 16 version of that and a posit 16 version, and then I just multiply it by the powers of 10. And you can immediately start seeing, first of all, that the con 
you have a conversion error when you convert from the um, decimal to the binary. So you don't get exactly 1.2345 from either floats or posits. And when you start multiplying, you see what first thing that happens with the floats is they do pretty well until they overflow. So it can't really hold a value above 10,000 much. And then you just go to infinity. The posits keep going because now the regime bits just grow longer and longer. But you notice that the actual value deteriorates. That's because you're losing the precision. So posits play off extended range with reduced precision. They give you increased precision for ordinary scale numbers. That's when you have very short exponents in the regime bits. But that causes problems with things like MKS units, physics constants like Avogadro's number or the Planck constant. Those are very large exponents. It saturates instead of overflow. One minute so remaining. You, so you don't get those infinities. And there's a few others. Now, the problem ones in red are the fact that with IEEE, you used to be able to multiply by factors of uh, powers of two and get exact numbers. That isn't true anymore. You now get multiplicative cancellation, which can be an unpleasant surprise. And the fact that the relative error is no longer constant, which makes numerical analysis difficult. And I'm just going to skip ahead. Sorry, before my conclusion, this is what makes them exciting for machine learning is that you can manipulate the 8-bit version of posit to get the sigmoid function, which would normally require an exponential, which is a very slow function to evaluate. So you can construct a pseudo sigmoid and have very fast uh, functions needed for machine learning. So in conclusion, there are numerical concerns, analytic tools are needed. It has potential as a storage format because it could store a little bit more precision. And, and you are out of time. Well. Thank you for specialized applications. Thank you very much, Kevin. We are now moving to Billy. Um, who is going to be talking about building a simple Telegram bot using Python, Flask, and Heroku, which is going to give Billy a moment to upload slides. Billy, please let us know when you are ready to go. Billy, are you there? Okay, something's happening. Hooray. We can't hear you, so if you're talking, you may need to jiggle your sound settings so that we can hear you. There's no sound. Still no sound. Uh, no, we can't hear you. I think you must be muted. Um, try going to the bottom and see if you need to um, need to enable your microphone. Maybe click on the headphones and see if you can change your sound settings. Ah, yes, turn it off and on again. Okay, you now seem to have sound on, but I'm used. Try talking now. We still can't hear. Still can't hear you. You appear to be muted in the um, in the list on the right. Can you unmute yourself? And now, can you hear me now? There we go. Yes, excellent. Oh, um, Thank you. All right. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Your time starts oh. now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Oh, next slide is there. Perfect. We are talking quickly about um, building a Telegram bot with Python and Flask. Um, we're part of a, we run a meetup that meets up every Thursday. And, um, and yeah, this is what we did actually last night. So to illustrate where Telegram is compared to other chat services. You can see over here that Signal is probably the most secure. Um, there's Harold at the top using that. 
Um, we've got Janine on the right who uses WhatsApp. And then we've got uh, Jackie at the bottom who is the happiest of all of them because she's using Telegram. Okay, why is uh, Telegram useful? Why why create a bot on Telegram? Well, it's it's a lot of it is self-explanatory. You can automate a whole lot of things with your bot. Um, you can engage with customers, um, get them to uh, engage with you and answer questions without actually needing expensive solutions. And they're relatively cheap to um, set up, which is what I'm going to show you. Okay, this is the source of what we did to build our Telegram bot. Um, you'll see this article is an 11 minute read. However, when you're actually building it yourself, it took us the full hour and a half of our Python meetup to actually build the bot, including solving one of the problems, which I'll tell you about. Um, I've created a short link over here um, so that you guys can get to the same article and follow this yourselves. Um, if you're following me now, this, it's impossible to build it in five minutes unless um, you know what you're doing. So step one is getting Telegram set up and, um, and as well as starting um, to code your bot engine. So on Telegram, you need to have it installed and, and an account created. And you contact a user called Botfather. I know it's a bit odd but you contact Botfather and you start sending Botfather some messages. Your first message that you want to send is slash new bot, and it uses a bot to create your bot. So you enter the name of your bot and the username of your bot. Um, I believe the username needs to be unique and it needs to have the word bot in it. And then bot, when, when, you, when your names are correct, uh, Botfather will generate a token for you, and you're going to need this token later so that you can copy it. Then you move over to um, your Python code. So for those of you who are well-versed in Python, you know that you uh, set up your environment variable. You do your pip installs. The problem with the actual article is they forgot to tell you to install gunicorn. So install that at the beginning as well, and um, it'll be even smoother when you follow the article. Then you put your code down. Um, this is your file structure. So you've got a, a Flask set up here. You've got a folder called Telebot with credentials in a separate file. And then this is your app.py. And your app.py, um, the, the code for your app.py is all given to you in the article. OK? Then the final um, stage is to set it up on Heroku and host your actual engine there. And you will need to download and install the Heroku CLI, the command line interface. You, If you don't have it, you install Git. Once this is set up, you need to get add your code, you commit it, and you push it to Heroku. Once you've pushed, boom, it works. So what this bot does in the example is you enter any name into the bot and One it generates an avatar. And as you can see, this is uh, my avatar is not really that happy. I'm normally a lot happier than the avatar would suggest. Okay, and that is the end of my chat. Feel free to uh, pop me questions if you've got any, if you have any. Um, if you are learning Python, feel free to um, join us. Whoop, that's my timer. Feel free to join us um, every Thursday evening. Um, there's the link over there, and uh, we're teaching Python to people who want to learn to code. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, and we are now moving to Adam, who is giving us a talk entitled RegBot. I wish we could do this for physical conferences. Just going to see if Adam is here. Looks like he's here. Adam, where are you? Are you here? His bot is still posting.
Hmm. Maybe we should s wait. Is someone? What's happening? Yes, it looks like he is here. Um, Adam, if you're talking, we can't hear you. But we can see you. Still can't hear you. Turn it off and on again. We are experiencing the traditional technical issues. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. OK, that's very odd. I, I literally had the echo testing working for me earlier anyway, and suddenly died. I think after I connect the webcam, I'll try to unplug now to be safe. OK, sorry about that. Um, so I, uh, oh, yes, um, should I start now? Uh, yes. Wait, 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 well, wait, wait, my thing to show up. Uh, can you make me, I mean, I'm not a presenter. Nothing's showing up. Uh, it was working earlier. Okay, there we go. Okay, getting, guess... getting spinny wheels. I'm not sure if other people can see. Can other people see the slides? It's not slides, it's video. Ah, uh, video. Yes, other people okay. can see it. All right, your time starts now. Okay, so uh, I don't have a fully pre prepared talk or anything like that. So basically, um, uh, just going off of uh, EuroPyCon, they had a registration bot, and uh, it's a nice one big file that did a similar thing, um, but they have to import a CSV file uh, with uh, the roles and the tickets and this and that. Uh, so last, normally we have like last minute um, people buying tickets of like like within ten minutes before the conference and quickly joining or even during the conference, um, and also I don't want I don't like handling files and CSV uh, like CSV stuff. So I have my own one and uh, uh, PyCon's a reg bot, uh, my own uh, GitHub, and uh, of course I'm I'm quite uh, I, I follow the twelve factor app principle, so like a bazillion environment variables, but no files to get, get uh, to f uh, throw around, so it's easy to use in uh, like <clears throat> uh, like Kubernetes kind of like environments and whatnot. Um, so uh, so uh, the features that we wanted to do was uh, uh, what it does is uh, actually before I sh uh, show you what it does, I'm just going to explain uh, quickly the, the the Discord bot. So the Discord bot um, is very async. It's, it natively uses um, uh, the, there we go, there we go, async dev. So basically, it's just uh, event driven. Uh, it is. Uh, this is actually a class uh, thing, but they all, they use decorators a lot. Uh, where you just decorate something, it's an async function, and then it's, it's uh, event triggered. But it's quite scalable, so you can start with just functions itself. You can have classes, or you can always go, you can go all the way up to cogs, which is a way where you can um, uh, uh, separate it out uh, for larger applications. So I'll just show a basic. Uh, my one actually use lots of files, like a, uh, I use a, um, like a init, the main. I actually use the, the Python's main to get the bot loaded. But uh, just to show you a very basic use case. So for example, commands. Uh, you know, actually, event. There we go. So, for example, when you guys, uh, when the bot is ready, it then notifies uh, us that's ready, and then on member join, it then says, "Oh, hello, the registration bot for this event is simply, um, yeah, just give all the instructions about hello and how to join." So, basically, this is a simple event, bot event, and on member join. You only have one uh, use case for on member join events, so it's literally just a function and uh, and a, a decorator, and that's it. Um, and in commands, uh, we register the command register. Uh, so when you type in uh, explanation mark register, and then just uh, types in, uh, and then just then goes to the, to the one main command, which is really the only command we have. Now, the external integrations uh, that we wanted. So um, we wanted, uh, so we wanted to go to uh, Quicket uh, to fetch our thing. So what we have is uh, we literally go uh, to the Quicket API. We basically fetch all this data. And it then stores it inside a nice little cache and updates the cache every every couple of minutes. Uh, and then we just uh, check the barcode if, if, if someone's inside uh, has an actual valid thing. And and uh, just to go to events, so, yeah, tasks, there we go. So here's, here's an example of a cog, actually. Um, so this uh, is uh, just go simple one, like uh, the quick at sync. So uh, you create, I have to create a cog for, for these. And here we just have a loop. We just say like this function, loop it, run it every, over here it's every um, number of minutes. It's gotten from the environmental variable. So this is, this one's every, I think 10 minutes. It just goes, goes quick, it fetches a new one. So it goes here, updates cache, 
and uh, just goes to the just just use the cache. Now, one thing to note, uh, since we're since we're talking about uh, external libraries, it uses HTTPX, for example, because um, we need async for everything. This is async everything, so um, HTTPX for this, um, and also other libraries have to be async enabled. That's one possible downside. Uh, for example, another thing to note is that you always have to you have to have an always live connection. So I wanted to use this for um, in something like like AWS Lambda, but it's not really going to work so well. You need to always live connection. One minute remaining. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so other things we get uh, we go to a wafer. Um, to fetch uh, the number of speaker, like the speech speakers, fetch calendar events. You notice we build up today. And the interesting thing about this is for backend state. So basically, as you notice, everything is just in a cache. Uh, these things just uh, update the cache, um, uh, just update caches uh, for everything, for tickets, events, and that has no state except for the backend database. Uh, interestingly enough, we use, if I can find this in time before it goes out, we use um, this is a, a, a mute, mute a, this is a this is a censored version. Basically, this is the database. It's the Google Sheet. It saves straight to the rows, so we can easily uh, like edit things if we need to, or if there's any problems with illustration, and basically just generate a nice thing. And this is actually the only state for the database, so that's the entire thing. Um, yeah, we uh, an example of a, jang of a wafer on the website, Python ZA, talks, and uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Oh, only thing only thing I haven't done yet zero test coverage. So and uh, you but are I'm out of time. going to do that with us. And that's it. Thank you. That's my th time as well. All right. Thank you very much, Adam. And now it is time for our final lightning talk by Kim, who's going to be querying whether we should all just go home on the third Friday afternoon. Go ahead. Doesn't really seem like much of a question, does it? Surely the answer is yes. Um, so let me just see if I can confirm. I'm expecting a slide to show up, unless it's just not showing for me. Can anyone see a slide? Nope. Nope. OK. My apologies. Let me try and it's going to upload it again, actually. That might be faster, to be brutally honest. Or not? OK. Right. Yes, we okay. see that. Your time Slides. starts now. Yes. All right. At uh, my workplace, we are fairly agile. We follow a lot of agile practices, which means we work in sprints. We have three-week sprint cycle. And then every third Friday morning, we have an all-team sprint review. There's about six teams. So ultimately, we're talking uh, 30 to 40 software developers and testers and the like. We have a sprint review. And what that means is that Anecdotally, my colleagues and I, at least the, the people I work with most often, feel like that Friday afternoon's a bit dead, or at least it feels a bit dead to us. And I was curious to know, basically, is it just us, or should we just say to the whole software development team, nobody's really doing anything on the third Friday afternoon, let's go home. So to prove that to the Python mobile I went, um, I took about 15 minutes to write a little bit of test code to check this. So, uh, I'm only showing the code mainly to illustrate that it didn't take me very long. I'm not going to keep it up for very long before people start wondering why it is that somebody pays me to write software. But effectively, um, the one of the ways I figured out we could tell if anybody really is working on that Friday afternoon is to look at our Git commits. We commit everything. There's lots of merge activity. There's lots of merge requests. There's lots of interaction on our Git repo. Is it actually being used on the third Friday afternoon? So effectively, here's a small piece of software to go to our Git and pull down a JSON, uh, effectively, dictionary of the number of events per day from Git. Um, there's a lot more of it than this. This is just a tiny snippet of the top of it. And a little bit more code to basically take that and plot it. And again, I'm not expecting anyone to be blown away by how wonderful my software is. It's just basically showing that you know if you have a little question you want to ask, and a little bit of time at your disposal. And relatively speaking, you can do it quite quickly with some Python. And to show my result, here's my plot. Basically, I've plotted every sprint review day in red and every working day in blue. Um, it's not accounting for things like public holidays and so forth, so it drops off in a couple of places. But it seems to show that my premise is close to right. 
The red lines are always smaller than the blue ones that surround it, so maybe we should just be going home on the third Friday afternoon. I have attempted to pass this past my, uh, my bosses. They don't really buy it, unfortunately. And I should just end on the note of kind of pointing out a somewhat lighthearted note. I'm not 100% um, serious in that, yes, I am showing we don't do much Git activity, but I'm being a little unfair to my colleagues in that, you know, sprint reviews happen on Friday afternoons and people do their learning on Friday afternoons and so forth. At least that's what they tell us. Um, I'm still convinced that we don't do enough on Friday afternoon to justify just not going home. And I keep trying to push it. So I thought maybe with a lightning talk, I could convince more people that maybe on the third Friday afternoon of your sprint review, I should go home. So if you'd be so kind as to contact my bosses and tell them that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kim. And thank you to all of our lightning talk speakers. If anyone has questions about their work, uh, please find them on Discord later. Um, you can chat about it.